So welcome back everybody to another webinar hosted from Princeton, available for everyone worldwide. Uh, we are very happy to have you with us and we're very grateful that you stay with us for the whole year 2020. This time around, I will give a different webinar because I will give a little bit of an overview uh, what happened in the last year, what did we learn and what did I learn from all the webinars uh, we had. And that's, I would like to combine it to a new theme and connect it to resilience or resilient society. And I think that's probably one of the main lessons we took away from that. I will put this in a little booklet down the road that's not done yet. It always takes longer than anyone thinks to put this together. But I'm very grateful for all of you to have participated to all the webinars on many, many of these webinars and also grateful to all the speakers. So we have many, many speakers we had over the year and we have more coming up uh, in 2021. And thank you for being part of it, being part of uh, this ride and this way of learning and to manage uh, the crisis. So let me summarize and provide a few highlights, but of course I cannot do justice for summarizing your almost 50 webinars in a few minutes. So I will not even attempt it. I will just try to put a common theme on uh, some of these webinars and give you a perspective, which I think is very, very important. So one theme which came up many, many times is that the COVID crisis essentially is like a naked swimmer moment as Warren Buffett mentioned it once. Uh, it is a moment where it also shows the weaknesses in our society. And it also shows us where we can improve our society. So it's a call for improving things. So we have learned that there's a lot of health externalities and the fact that there's no universal health care limited sickly for some people makes the situation worse and actually is hitting them back their spillback effects from that as well if people cannot stay at home when they're sick they still have to go to work because otherwise they have no income and we have also learned there's a substantially higher death rate among minorities and that's actually not healthy for our society so this all these externalities call us to rethink how we should uh, live together and uh, that's one of the themes I would like to come back to. The other theme, which is the trend accelerator phenomenon. So there were a lot of trends in our society. The COVID crisis has actually made it much, much faster. And sometimes it's so fast that it's actually very hard to keep up with it. So there is an optimal speed and it can be too fast in terms of change. And that's for many people, it's hard to adopt to this uh, fast changes. And that's another concern we have to keep in mind. But the main theme I really would like to stress home is on resilience. So we have learned we should not only focus on efficiency, but also resilience. And then there's a the question, what is actually resilience from an economic perspective or more formally perfumed? So resilience is very different from risk. It is connected to risk. But while risk is more or less measured by a variance or standard deviation, how volatile is something, resilience is a dynamic concept and it's about the mean reversion. So here I put the little man, he can, he, I can make him uh, handle this risk that he doesn't tipple over by putting him between two walls and then he's um, not exposed to the risk. Resilience means much more, you're still potentially exposed to the risk but you also get back up onto your feet very easily. So you can bounce back. So it's a much more dynamic concept. It does not mean you're not exposed to risk at all. You are exposed to risk, but when you're hit, you have the ability to come back. So it's a little bit like, you know, instead of being squeezed between two um, concrete walls, you might be squeezed between two rubber walls. So you, you hit, you fall over, but then the rubber wall brings you back or it's like a trampoline. And that's, I think, very, very important to understand. It's also important to understand if there are extreme events. If you do risk management, you focus very much on the tail risks. Or big extreme events are tail risk, small probability events. When you focus more on resilience, you also focus on real events. But what's really dangerous, if this real event occurs and then you're trapped and you can't bounce back. So this trap avoidance is very, very important. So if you focus on risk management, it's very much, you know, focus on extreme events, on tail risks. 
If you do resilience management, it's very much focusing to avoid traps. So even as a policymaker or any decision maker in our society has to have a world when you, where it's really good to be careful to be trapped in very bad circumstances and can't get back out of it. And we of course would like to design a society um, where you know we have the ability to bounce back and potentially that's uh, we would like to achieve down the road. So what is this resilience? How can we think about resilience? And how can we draw some analogies about this resilience phenomenon? One is that is it actually helpful to have a very diverse society or to have a very monoculture society? Uh, does this help and strengthen resilience or not? And there are two forces at work. So one is if you have a very diverse society, then the shocks are more idiosyncratic than symmetric. If you have a very monoculture, if you think of some trees, like here, they are very, very similar. If there's a particular bug coming, it wipes out the whole forest. If you have a diverse a structure, there's a particular bug coming, it doesn't wipe out everybody's because the diverse structure is typically more resilient to any, uh, for, uh, any form of attack. Could be a virus, could be anything else. But on the other hand, if you have a very homogeneous society, we know from Alberto Alessina, from the late Alberto Alessina, who passed away this year, that there's more willingness for the society to ensure each other. So there are two forces. So if you have a more homogeneous society, people are more willing to ensure each other and overcome idiosyncratic shocks. But if it's very homogeneous society, you're also exposed to the same shock at the same time, while a diverse society uh, is less exposed to. And that holds for societies, holds for any uh, systems we might face, biological systems. The other thing is we should stay flexible. So we should be adaptable, agile whenever something comes. And the third aspect I would like to mention is that uh, there's a growth phenomenon. If an economy is growing at a healthy speed, uh, you're much more resilient against shocks. So you can think of a bicycle rider as an analogy of the bicycle rider. Whenever there's some side winds coming, it might throw you over in one direction or the other direction. If you're too slow, if the economic growth is too slow, then actually you're much more likely to flip over one or the other side. On the other hand, if, the, if you're driving at a healthy speed, if there's side wind coming, uh, you might uh, sustain the side winds much more easily. So we should have a society where the economic growth is uh, healthy and, and this way we can also keep our balances in the society much more common. So when I step back here about the resilience, how can we achieve this resilience? Of course, we would like to have a social contract uh, who is actually affecting this resilience uh, in this way. And that's, you know, if I give an economic interpretation of this social contract, uh, going back to Thomas Hobbes and uh, John Locke and Rousseau and so forth, but very much uh, the Thomas Hobbes perspective is more or less an externality interpretation. I can actually cause externalities on others by easily, you know, I can steal your car, I can steal some of your property. And the government's role is essentially to enforce property rights such that not everybody can cause externalities on others. Okay, so if you live in a society where we can easily, you know, take whatever we want, total freedom, that will actually not be a very free society because everybody has to protect himself or herself against uh, the others. So we would like to have a government, a social contract that certain things are not allowed. And you can, for example, have certain property or can have certain issues, uh, you know, secured to minimize the externalities. And you would like to have a social contract which limits uh, such uh, interventions and makes us more resilient. Okay, and then these externalities can be from others but it can also be from mother nature. So these are the shocks we are facing and a social contract should you know, be designed in order to limit the externalities from others and also limit the externalities from mother nature, which are shocks. And in particular, if they are idiosyncratic shocks, then we can actually ensure each other against these. And what's the difference in terms of resilience? It doesn't mean you have to take the risk away altogether, but it should be a way that you know, when somebody has faces a shock, he has the ability to come back, to bounce back. So the emphasis here is much more on resilience, giving somebody a ladder once he falls in a hole to come back rather than providing universal basic income or universal insurance, and he might not face any shock in the first place because there's total compensation to that. So again, this resilience comp 
component is always showing up for, uh, further and further. And so how can we achieve such a social contract uh, is of course, uh, society can enforce that or the government can enforce that. And what's for me, it's very telling. If you look across the countries, which countries have handled the COVID crisis very well, there's of course a lot of technology was put into place, but there's some, is one country in particular where they have not employed a lot of technology, not a lot of testing, but they have handled the COVID crisis uh, with few cases or relative limited number of cases. And that's the country is Japan. In Japan, and I think that points to it, how important the social norms are, that how important in what society you live, what are the, the social norms which make it potentially less likely, so how much you care about the others, how much you're part of the society, and the social norms play a huge important role uh, in order to understand that. But more generally, there's of course a uh, competition. We talked about this in some of these webinars, where so now we have through the health externalities, this, the welfare function, the maximum on the line between an authoritarian system and an open society. So I've put uh, Joseph Stalin here and uh, F. R. Hayek here. So that actually might have shifted temporarily, hopefully, uh, to a different world where you know the government is better than internalizing all the externalities and imposing and limiting the freedom which you would like to enjoy in an open society. Of course, if you have an open society, everybody can choose his own um, uh, products or whatever he wants to do. There's freedom, so there's better information aggregation in this open society, and there's more freedom in this open society. But of course, during the COVID crisis, we have these huge health externalities, and the optimal point here, this green dot, might be shifting towards uh, less freedom uh, temporarily. And the hope is that this will be only a temporary phenomenon uh, rather than a permanent phenomenon. We have seen from some of the women speakers said, when the speed limit in the US was introduced during the oil price uh, crisis in the 1970s, you impose certain limitations and then they stay on even decades later. So we have to see whether that will be the case uh, in this setting as well. So these are more the big picture philosophical uh, perspective, but I would like to stress this resilience uh, focus. That's for me, besides COVID, is the key word of 2020, and it will show up over and over again in many, many of the themes that we can connect it. And many of the webinars we can connect to the theme of resilience. So let me just highlight a few points, and I will make this a shorter webinar than usual uh, because it's uh, no interaction, uh, so it's more me talking only. So we talked about the social contract. I will talk about a little bit the resilience management with regard to health testing and all this, what we have learned during this year. Then about the long run effects about innovation and scarring, and then the macro money finance effects like the financial whipsaw, potential inflation whipsaw and so forth. And at the end, one slide on, on the global resilience. Now, what is really people's, what people are driving in social distancing? So if you think about the health respect, you know, you have, so you have externalities, people impose externalities on each other. So whether I wear a mask or not, I impose an externality on somebody, whether I get a uh, vaccination or not. If I don't get a vaccination, I impose more externalities on others. So being vac getting vaccinated is helpful for myself, but it's also an, a positive externality on others. And I think the behavior of people changed dramatically between the first wave in the spring and the second wave in the fall of the COVID crisis. In the first wave, we had essentially a sharp lockdown and in certain countries in particular, and the COVID behavior, the behavior of individuals was driven by fear or anxiety. So people were suddenly afraid. And we had one uh, webinar where Raj Chetty showed this very clearly, you are, whether it was a lockdown or not, people really scaled back. They didn't go to restaurants, they, did, they didn't do many, many things because they were just afraid. So the government did some lockdowns in certain countries, but not lockdowns in other countries, but or in states across the United States, you can see the behavior moved very parallel in both of these states, independently of what the government did, because people were afraid themselves. And of course, it could be that the lockdown was essentially just a communication device. It just was a way for the government to signal how serious the situation is and created anxiety and fear among the public. And then the public uh, was scaling back. And that's 
the scaling back happened, uh, whether it was uh, lockdown, official lockdown was declared or not, but the fear happened at the global level. So whether you compare Sweden and Denmark, there was scaling back independently. Sweden had very little lockdown compared to Denmark, similar Wisconsin and Minnesota to US states, it's similar uh, outcome there. So that was the characterization of what drove people's behavior in terms of social distancing and other elements in the first wave. The second wave is very different, in particular in Europe, where the summer, it was uh, fairly relaxed. And in the second wave, uh, suddenly there's much less willingness to uh, do social distancing compared to the first wave. And that explains to some extent, besides the seasonal patterns, which we have also heard about why COVID has a seasonal pattern in the webinar series, uh, is this what I call this COVID fatigue or denial or where I say, okay, I become more fatalistic. If COVID hits me, it will hit me. And of course, we all have a better way to deal with COVID cases this way around, but there's now much more willingness to take the risk and the fear is not the driving force anymore. One explanation, there are many of them, could be an explanation where, you know, I don't want to have this fear with me because it creates negative utility, there's no anticipatory utility by having this negative uh, prospect. So I like to believe that I will not be hit uh, by the COVID uh, virus. And this way, because I think I'm, I will not be hit, I will change my behavior and will be less careful uh, in particular when it's about social distancing and other aspects. So typically there's an optimal belief distortion. The optimal belief distortion is always, if I'm more optimistic, but then actually I would be happy, I have more anticipatory utility, but typically I also make some mistakes, I'm less careful, that will hurt me down the road. And there's an optimal beliefs and optimal expectations you face here. And you can see that now is like, okay, I have this balance. Um, if I believe I will not be hit, I will not be careful, but I have more freedom, I can enjoy more. I can also look forward to a much more optimistic future. But then it gives me a negative outcome in the future, more likely, and that hurts me. But if the government locks down anyway, I can actually not change my future behavior anyway. So it's all about anticipatory utility, and hence, I will actually be more optimistic. So the optimism is typically contained by the fact that I make mistakes. But if I can't, I don't have the freedom to make mistakes, I can dream more freely and can think I will not be hit by COVID anyway. So that gives me a different perspective on utility. So there might be different, that's just one explanation, but in general, it's, it's an interesting behavioral phenomenon, why it is the case that, you know, we have such a different uh, attitudes towards COVID compared to the spring and the fall of uh, 2020. Another main insight of the COVID uh, webinar series was that actually, which came up very early on with Paul Roma and, and others, the testing is, is cheap. Um, so it's uh, the cost of testing is tiny. We should invest a lot in testing uh, compared to locking down the economy, which costs but $200 billion a week. And a tiny, the cost of testing is almost negligible for that. We have not seen, we have seen the testing developing, but not as fast as possible. Uh, possible. Similarly, the cost of producing vaccine is also totally tiny compared to the lockdown. And the two principles, for example, uh, uh, what was uh, late in one of the webinars was we should develop 14 vaccines in parallel. So we have heard a lot of redundancy away from efficiency, focus on redundancy, develop them in parallel and throw them away. And then the question is what vaccine should be developed? And then we said, oh, we should develop vaccines which we have learned in May already in our webinar with low correlation. So if uh, the different uh, vaccines are less likely to be similar, you develop very, very heterogeneous vaccines. So a portfolio, take a portfolio approach. And that's what we have learned. And that's what I took uh, recently from a newspaper article where you can see that, you know, you can see how many vaccines have different countries bought. So Canada is at the top and that's for how many vaccines everybody has per person. And Canada has seven or eight, almost eight vaccine per person. So there's totally too many vaccines they have bought. So there's a lot of redundancies and that's, you know, that's uh, one important component that's the same is for the US and UK and Germany and so forth. 
And then the question is how to diversify. Of course, we have different types of vaccines. We have the modern vaccines with mRNA vaccines. Then you want to do some of them. We also want to invest in some more traditional ways of producing vaccines. And you can see this that the countries took a portfolio approach on this as well. So this was one of the early insights uh, which you know, Larry Summers and Michael Kramer and others are put forward in the webinar series, which actually played out uh, very, very uh, uh, forcefully in the way it was implemented as well. And I think that's um, now showing fruit and we have you know, hopefully the vaccines coming up in the next few months. Then the next uh, thing I would like to group is that we had some long lasting impact. What are the long lasting impacts on uh, the, of the COVID crisis, the economic impact? So let's move away from the health perspective, what are the economic impacts? And the economic impacts is one is that one is a good thing. It might be actually a trend accelerator. It might be an innovation boost. And we have had a lot of webinars with say, okay, you overcome certain problems, regulatory problems, regulatory shackles are removed or the squarety problem, which we have discussed recently, were essentially why is our keyboard uh, assigned, why are the keys assigned this way, like with the squarety assignment, which does make no sense right now, but it made sense in the late 19th century when we had typewriters with the hammers uh, smashing more often. So you would like to assign the letters such that the letters which are close to each other should be not frequently typed together. Now, that's a typical problem we have. And once you have a big shock, you might be thrown away, might be thrown out of it. So you might be in a, some QWERTY solution where you're in a local minimum or maximum. And you know this might throw you out and might reach a better long run allocation of that. So the QWERTY is just a particular example. And so what you saw is that you see our boost of telemedicine, a lot of regulation was removed. A lot of innovation was taking soft information, how to manage, uh, uh, companies and manage certain arrangements. We had a whole lecture on home offices. And what are the implications on the real estate market with the donut effect, where is the center of cities, firms will move out and move in the suburbia. And that's what's referred to as the donut effect. We have online learning and we have these conferences. Now we have these new webinars. We have digital money gaining in prominence much faster than we thought. And of course we will live much more in a virtual world than we did before. So there will be positive effects, positive long run effects uh, from innovation boost and as we have discussed before. But there are also scarring effects and the scarring effects will be long run negative effects. And that points to a slower recovery and the scarring effects come at least in three flavors. There will be some scarring effects which are due to beliefs. People will be less optimistic, they will be more pessimistic and less risk taking that limits growth down the road might lead to more savings. Uh, but overall, it, the risk premium might be staying higher down the road. So there is actually a long run belief scarring effect and preference scarring effect uh, going on. Then we have on the labor market, a scarring effect that many people lost their jobs. So the matches, the labor matches between workers and firms are broken and there will be will take some time to bring them back. And especially women are hit this time compared to men. And that's very unusual because typically when we go in a recession, the durable sector is hit, the construction sector is hit, that hits a lot, primarily men and women in the service sector, which are more in the service sector, are not hit so much. And this crisis is the first crisis where it's the other way around. And we have uh, talked about that. And then you have firm scoring effects. The balance sheets will be impaired. There will be debt overhang problems. And we will have to handle these debt overhang problems, especially small and medium enterprises will have problems to deal with that. There will be potentially a lot of liquidations going on and the, still open how to handle that. And for large firms, we have some debt restructuring possibilities through chapter 11 bankruptcy code. And there's a very different, so large firms might benefit uh, are less concerned because you have this debt restructuring for smaller firms, it's much more challenging. And we had one webinar focusing on this difference between small and large firms uh, highlighting that. Now, this is about the real long-term impact on the firm sector, also on innovation. But then we had looked also on the financial side, the financial uh, sector. And that's where we why I call this financial markets whipsaw. In March, it looked very scary. In March 2020, we had shivers, but then it followed by a very strong recovery. If you look at the stock market, 
stock market went down, but now we are at record highs. And the IPOs are like in 1999 during the Nasdaq bubble. So it's really at record highs. If you look at the government bond market and uh, the treasury market, the treasury market was very shaky. The intermediation, the market making was not working anymore for long-term treasuries, which was a very unusual phenomenon. And the central bank stepped in as a market maker of last resort for the US treasury market. So the Fed stepped in and this was a new role essentially for the central banks to take on to be the market maker of last resort. And what's about the corporate bond market? The, the, the Fed essentially stepped in or central bank stepped in to remove the tail risk. So the Fed is, was not buying a lot of corporate bonds yet, but there was a stand ready as a backstop. If something goes wrong, we'll step in. So they took away the tail risk. And the response essentially was a bond bonanza. Essentially, if you look here, that's again what I talk from the Wall Street Journal uh, recently, uh, you see the issuance of corporate bonds and there's a, or they call it corporate bond blowouts. You see there was a record bond issuance this year. Also, even though in a financial crisis, the issuance, the amount of issuance of corporate bonds is just at a record height. And no comparison to previous years is always the first nine months uh, of the year. How was it at the international uh, market? It was the same in the international market. We had about a global financial crisis to uh, come about in March 2020. And we talked about this huge outflow during the COVID crisis of capital flows from emerging markets during the stress period. And that was way larger than in previous periods, like the taper tantrum, the global financial crisis, the COVID outflows were significantly larger. But then uh, the interest rate cut in the US and the new repo facilities to repo treasuries with uh, the Fed for international investors stabilized the situation in March and early April, and then actually came back. So the outflows have flowed back to some extent. You can see that they are flowing back uh, in the recent months. Uh, so that things stabilized significantly, but there was a huge shiver in 2020. So why I call this the whipsaw, we had this huge a threat in March 2020, in April 2020, and then this huge stabilization and reaching in many, many markets new record heights. And that's, I think, a very interesting phenomenon. And the question is, you know, how will this go on? Uh, in particular, you know, we have to still bridge the gap until the vaccine is taking over. Now, what else are the big challenges? Of course, the public debt levels are really, really getting high. And we had a debate, you know, should we still look at debt to GDP ratios, uh, which is, has a time dimension on it. But, you know, the price of the time, the interest, interest rate is not on the debt to GDP ratio. Or should we look at debt servicing cost and the state servicing cost might suddenly jump if the interest rate goes up. And then we should look at the value at risk of the debt servicing cost to have a distributional capturing how risky is it that the debt servicing costs are going up. But in general, what we have is the debt level is going up and the interest rate is going down, but the debt servicing cost as a whole uh, is not going up, it's actually going down. So why is that? And in order to understand this, why government debt has such a low interest rate, there are many phenomena uh, to explain this, demographics and others and low growth. But one uh, phenomenon is that we have to be asset pricing how we price government debt has not only a cash flow component. So typically when we price asset, we have the expected present value of cash flows, you know, the dividends and interest payments and so forth, but they also provide a service flow. Government bonds and safe asset in particular provide a service flow. And what is the service flow? The service flow is that these government bonds, you can read rate very easily. And you can hold as a safe asset so when you have this asset and you face a negative shock because your car breaks down, you have a healthcare expenditure, you can save, sell the safe asset and then you can go on with your life. So this safe asset is easy to retrade and hence you can partially insure with your fellow citizen, uh, whoever has this idiosyncratic shock is hit by the shock, he can sell the safe asset and go on with his life. And the other who doesn't have a shock, he's happy to buy this asset at that time. So the interest rate, and that's, you know, the formula we went through many times, the interest rate of the real interest rate is essentially the time preference rate, how much you enjoy utility now compared to future. 
then the growth rate of the economy grows faster, then the interest rate will be higher too. But importantly, there's this volatility term. If the risk is higher, but then actually you would like to use this government bond, the safe asset to do this partial insurance, you hold more in the safe asset. And if something goes wrong, you can sell it in order to go on with your life. So the higher the risk is you're facing, the lower the real interest rate will be. Okay, and that also explains when you go into COVID crisis, suddenly the risk is really, really high, and then the interest rate is going down significantly. So that's, you know, this gamma is, is our risk aversion coefficient, or so the curvature of the utility function. And if there's more risk aversion, and if there's more risk, then the risk free rate will be lower because people want to save more in the safe asset for precautionary reasons. In particular, if you don't know what's going on, will you be hit by COVID or will you not be hit by COVID? But of course, the safe asset status of a government bond is not secured. Uh, it is like a bubble. It's safe because others think it's safe. So when you're in trouble, you can sell the safe asset to somebody else who think, oh, that's a safe asset. I'm happy to hold it at a low interest rate. But that has a public component to it. And the safe asset status might be lost and might pop like a bubble. Okay? And that for that, it's important that you have fiscal space to defend uh, the bubble component. And that's where, again, uh, the debt to GDP ratio comes back into play. If you have low debt to GDP ratio, you can actually raise taxes and defend your government bond. If you're overly indebted, then you might not be able to defend this bubble. And then there's uh, the value at risk. This might be a whole more risky uh, uh, moving around. The interest rate jumps and you cannot bring it down again uh, because of that. That leads me to the next topic, which is again about resiliency, which is about the tail and trap risk you might be falling in the trap with regard to inflation. And in particular, what's interesting about inflation, in the short run, we had huge amounts of deflationary pressure. So there was a lot of low inflation. We have inf inflation measure issues, but a lot of things you cannot consume. Demand is depressed because you cannot consume a restaurant, go into restaurants or buy certain things. So you have deflation in certain products. You have, of course, a little bit of inflation in other products, but overall you have deflationary pressure in, in the early phase. But later on, you might have inflationary pressures and you might end up in a trap. And as I said earlier, traps are resilience killers. Okay, once you're in a trap, you can't bounce back. You're just stuck there. Uh, but and central bankers have to be aware of the deflation trap and the inflation trap. Right now, there's a lot of focus on the deflation trap uh, of course, there's also an inflation trap you have to keep in mind. And in particular, if there's fiscal and financial dominance, which we talked in this uh, webinar series as well. So in order to stay away and to master this first is deflationary pressures and then the inflationary pressures, you have to first accelerate a lot in order to avoid this deflation. And then you have to put the brakes on if inflation were to come to put the brakes on. So you need essentially a central bank with, with a lot of independence and good you need good macro potential tools in order to make sure that don't get into financial dominance regions. So it's a little bit like a, what we said, a race car. You need good accelerators in order to avoid that uh, deflation trap, but you also need good brakes and good independence is, is this good break. Um, and so the central bank should maintain their independence. Now, that's more for what I mentioned here, the long run macroeconomy innovation, and we had the scarring effects, but then we had this uh, more policy relevant aspects and the whipsaws, the financial whipsaw and uh, the inflation whipsaw. And then we also uh, talked a little bit about within the country hit uh, the inequality. Remember there was, of course, if households don't have enough savings and US households don't have much savings, then they're not very resilient to shocks. Okay, so if suddenly you have a healthcare expenditure, you have a car breaking down, your washing machine breaking down, you cannot, you cannot bounce back so easily. And what we have learned in one of the webinars by Raj Chetty, essentially what's really interesting, there's a real huge regional inequality and especially the poor and affluent neighborhoods, they have suffered the most because the affluent people, they're moved out of Upper West Side in Manhattan and the poor which stayed there and were servant um, to the affluent, they are actually suddenly the demand uh, broke away. And, uh, you know, that could, you know, was for them, it was an income shock, essentially. But of course, there was the government stepping in uh, as well, but it was more the poor in the affluent neighborhoods who suffered the most. And that was an insight, uh, which, you know, looking at the data, at the regional data, there was a huge regional uh, inequality 
and coming up. So being poor in a rich neighborhood was you were hit the most. Of course, there was racial gaps, and I mentioned this initially already, even in, in healthcare. So African American citizens suffered much more than uh, non African American citizens or minority citizens suffered more. There's a gap about online education. We saw online education being much more easily picked up by wealthy neighborhoods than uh, by poorer neighborhoods because they just don't have the internet speed, they don't have the uh, tools to do so. And how to measure, of course, inequality is very tricky because, you know, just income, they're both static measures, they're snapshots, and we have to have more dynamic elements to it in order to see the bounce back. So the bounce back, so resilience is essentially a dynamic concept. So let me conclude with the global perspective about global resilience, just one slide, uh, we could have five webinars on this uh, as well, is what is special about emerging markets and developing economies? One thing which is really special is that the trade-offs are much more stark. And what we argued is that there's a visible versus invisible health trade-off, life versus livelihood. So essentially, the COVID death become very, very visible. And there's a lot of attention paid on the COVID death. But if you lock down the economy too stark, there will be other death because of other health issues or because of starvation simply. And these are not seen. And that leads to distorted picture and leads also to distorted decision making by policymakers who are then driven by certain media components. So one has to keep this in mind that, you know, focusing too much, making too much the policy space is very limited in developing countries in on the health dimension but also uh, on the more generally how to maintain a healthy economy. And the fiscal response typically in the advanced economy is about 20% of GDPs and middle income 6% and 2% for the very less developed, least developed countries. So you see the fiscal response is very, very focused on the rich countries and that makes the whole thing way more challenging. There will be significant amount of countries where we have to think about debt restructuring. We had some webinars talking about that. And then there was some debate about globalization. So what's about trade, international trade? There was the argument um, that trade was you know, growing very strongly in the last few decades. And instead of deglobalization, it was actually stabilizing. And what was very interesting in one of this webinar by Stephen Redding is that actually uh, trade was collapsing but coming back by the end of the year quite strongly. And last week, you have seen that, of course, that globalization, it's not deglobalization, refers very much on trades, but not necessarily on services, technology transfers. So if you have a broader perspective of trade, uh, of international cooperation, there is definitely a deglobalization going on also because of political pressures, uh, even though the goods transferred back and forth, if you purely look at the physical goods, uh, you might also say it's only a, only a globalization. We talked about a lot about the global value chains. Um, uh, there were several webinars on that with Penny Goldberg and others. And, and then the big emphasis here is essentially that so far we had global value chains really to minimize costs. So outsourcing to minimize costs, go to the country with the lowest uh, labor costs and also make it very, very um, fast and just in time management was the way to go. Now I come back to my resilience term and the resilience is actually all over the place. You might not want to outsource only to a single uh, other supplier. You might want to do dual sourcing, potentially from different continents. And in order, in, instead of having just in time, you want to have just in case, just in case if something goes wrong, just in case if something um, uh, blows at your face or some crisis occurs, you have different sources and, and the dual sourcing, triple sourcing from different continents, ideally, uh, will be uh, very, very prominent. So it's not clear it will lead to reshoring. Uh, that will be some phenomenon as well, but it might be much more outsourcing to many, many different countries, two or three from different continents in order to gain more resilience. So that was a, a little overview, and I hope it gives you some perspective on some deja vu moments where saying, oh, yes, I remember. I've heard this many months ago. That's what I've learned. And I would like to thank you again for being part of this ride. And I think that uh, I really enjoyed it. And I hope you enjoyed it too. And I hope you will stick around next year. We'll keep on going. Uh, we have a great lineup of new speakers uh, in January. 
Jay Powell, the Fed chairman is coming. Charles Kutat will talk about inflation threats, early January and so forth. And I wish you all happy holidays. Take the quiet time, reflect and keep thinking and stay curious and with high spirit. Thanks again. And I will switch now. If there's some questions, I will try to address the questions. So there's a question about the, about the, the corporate bond market. You know, once the uh, Treasury together with the Fed uh, essentially took a tail risk away, and the, the, the bond market really snapped back and is actually at the record issuing height as, well, as I mentioned. And the question is, why is it actually the case that um, when it was a question, so the Treasury Secretary was actually trying to scale back on that, that it's actually uh, you know, didn't do much on the copper bond market. I don't have an answer. It's probably a good question to ask next year on January 14th, I think, uh, for Jeremy Powell to, to get a take on that. Uh, but my inclination essentially is to think about people, the market is already looking beyond uh, the current Trump administration to think, okay, when the uh, Joe Biden administration comes in with uh, Janet Yellen as new treasury secretary, they will reinstate that and the market have, uh, was not so worried that the tail risk will materialize in the next few weeks uh, and thinks through that. Um, then I would say the next question is by Hiro Dron about uh, Japan, what gave the society so much resilience? So I don't have any details on the Japanese situation, but my understanding from talking to Japanese friends is that you care a lot about the neighborhood. The social pressure is uh, very pronounced in Japan that you care about the neighbors. You have a tradition of mask wearing and you consider it about your neighbors. And that made a huge difference uh, in, uh, for the Japanese situation, even though Japan did not introduce any technological advancements in, in terms of new ways of tracing or new ways of testing, just following uh, social distancing and the social norms they have, were usually used to made a huge difference in their situation. Um, so let me. So the, so the two hands up from my Marcelo, let me just allow you to talk. Sorry for doing this on the spot without consulting you. Marcelo, do you want to say something? Or Jürgen Pracht? So if you want, if you want to talk, uh, Marcelo or Peter Jungen or Bengt. So I allow everybody to talk. Uh, okay, I just want to thank you a lot. Oh no, thanks, Bengt. For, for wonderful, wonderful, uh, you know, for full sessions. No, well, thanks. That was especially your, I enjoyed your webinar and always talking to you was very, very insightful. So a lot of these insights, you know, our conversations helped me on this dramatically too. Yeah. And we keep on talking next year, 2021. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Can I? Yes. Marcus? Yes, uh, Peter. Peter Jung, can I speak? Yes, yes. Okay, Marcus, you were, you were my shining light during oh. the lockdown with all your efforts and your events. And I'm not sure how many people in Europe or Germany were uh, regularly listening, but I'm trying to spread the message that you have this uh, on, and hopefully this will be going on next year. So congratulations. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Okay. So the two more hands, let me just open three more hands and then we close, but perhaps. Um, <coughs> but we should focus on the substance, not to thank me or anybody. <laughs> it's because without you, it would not have happened. Okay. All of you. Hello. 
Yes, Paganta. Yeah, hi. Yeah, the, uh, thank you very much. This is a very, very uh, enlightening talk. And uh, really, Lord, uh, I, I, did, I missed several of these webinars. I, I believe that these are all available online. I can go back and check, right? That's, that's correct. Yeah, they're all on, on YouTube. Yeah, I have a question to you. Maybe it is already covered in one of the webinars. You, you, talk, at, you, you talk about tail, taking, taking away tail risk. Mm -hmm. which is an interesting concept, so, but exactly what, what do you exactly mean by that? And how does the central bank, how can the central bank really do that? Is this like quantitative easing or some any other policy? Uh, so so it's essentially, like it's a backstop policy by the central bank. Uh, so certain risks, which are rare events, and often, you know, the system is getting out of control and it's their feedback loops. And so things get worse and worse. And then if somebody steps in, a powerful player steps in and stops this feedback loop, uh, then the risk is not materializing. And essentially what the Fed said with, with respect to the corporate bond market, if you can't sell your bonds, if things get really bad and the price jumps high at certain you know, low price of the bonds, we will step in and help out. And that calmed the nerves of many investors that, okay, if some things go really, really bad, the central bank together with US Treasury will step in and that gives them a calm and help out already in this. And it doesn't really materialize at the end of the day because the system doesn't spiral out of control. So just, that, okay, that basically means quantitative easing, a continued bond purchase or this asset purchase. Is that a tail risk example, taking out a tail risk? That's, I mean, I would say it's more in terms of tail risk, it, it has not materialized, essentially just saying, I'm ready, I backstop the system if it were necessary, but so far it was not necessary. Uh, so that was not necessarily the current QE program, the quantitative easing, it was more the corporate bond purchase program, was that oh, if something were to go wrong, we would step in. And that itself was enough. You don't even have to step in. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Are there any other questions? Okay. I see Robert and Thomas raising their hand. Oh, Robert is in twice. Okay, uh, if there's... Uh, hello, Marcus? Yes. Hi, uh, Robert. Uh, greetings from the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, um, I also want to reiterate uh, the very strong uh, feeling of, uh, of um, great uh, gratitude for uh, uh, keeping us intellectually less isolated uh, during the COVID period and um, greatly appreciated your organizational prowess and the many insights that you have offered. So I, I raised two questions. To, um, one, one is a sort of very um, applied question, which, which is with regard to China and the relative position of Asia, which uh, obviously also there's the Japanese case, but many other countries, including Vietnam, and wondering the extent to which part of the uh, crisis will be a, a shift in the extent of segmentation, perhaps, of Asia relative to the rest of the world, but also the relative position. And the, the other question, which is um, uh, obviously something for uh, greater reflection, is um, to what extent has the COVID crisis maybe um, revealed certain limitations of existing economic methodology and thinking? And obviously, this is not a, a two-second question, but I, I, I do think it it's worth our profession thinking about the latter question as well. Yeah, these are two deep questions which require you know, a whole series of webinars. Um, and we touched upon the, the first question last week with Adam Posen to some extent where we said, okay, are we drifting to a bipolar world? And that's probably what you're indicating as well. Um, and or we, you know, we stay in a multilateral arrangement at the one globe uh, together. And first of all, the COVID crisis has shown that we actually are together. We have to cooperate. It's not, we cannot divide the world in a sense. And, you know, I think I'm hopeful that we will be able to avoid a drift apart and we stay, and we stay interconnected. And uh, 
But of course, there's always threats. So it depends very much, I think, on the main decision makers in the next uh, few weeks or, or months and years uh, to figure out where we are going. With regard to the second question, I totally agree with you that the COVID crisis has revealed a lot of uh, insights. So we have a lot of new research to do. We have new data to look at and all this, but we also have a new behavioral phenomenon to understand. And to a large extent, the COVID crisis was also an experiment to learn uh, more. So for example, as I mentioned, the COVID fear was the COVID fatigue you can explain this with many different uh, behavioral models, uh, but we, we might be able to distinguish this much, get a much deeper understanding, and it might also be uh, fruitful to you know bring more psychology uh, into into this analysis uh, in our framework. But overall, thanks a lot for for all of you for being loyal followers, and uh, I know some of you were almost there all every week, and I really appreciate that and um, we stay in touch over Zoom. And I wish you all uh, happy holidays and um, stay curious and let's make the most out of it. And then that's the thing which makes us resilient as uh, human beings. Happy New Year.